Good morning. Can you hear me? <laughs> My name is Becky Donnelly, and I'm the chairman of the missions committee here at Abundant Life. And I was thinking um, very recently about the Benzels and our relationship with them. And way back in 2001, um, we were reorganizing our mission program here. And we were looking for missionaries to support throughout the world. In the past, when we were an American Baptist church, we just sent our mission money to the American Baptist Association, and they would distribute it. But we wanted to personalize our missions program, so we reorganized it, and we wanted to handpick our missionaries. And so we were really committed to having a presence throughout the world. And one of the places that we were very interested in was Russia or Eastern Europe. And when we read the profile of the Benzels and we were introduced to them, we knew that this was a ministry that we wanted to be part of. They were already in Russia. Dave was teaching at Far East Russia Bible College. <laughs> and um, Sharon was working right alongside him, supporting him and doing other things with Send International, which is the mission board that they're associated with. And um, we not only became supporters, but we became fast friends. And we have uh, partnered with them ever since 2001. In 2008, uh, we got an email from them saying that Russia was uh, tightening their borders and they were not allowing um, missionaries to get visas like they used to. They were tightening things up. And so Dave and Sharon realized that they were going to have to leave Russia. And I was so proud of Dave because he wasn't discouraged by that. He thought, well, then, how am I going to reach the Rus Russian people? What can I do? So they got themselves appointed to serve in Ukraine. Well, we all know Ukraine now. Maybe back then you weren't even familiar with Ukraine, but I'm sure Dave's going to share a lot about Ukraine. But Dave thought, well, I can serve in Ukraine. And I was so proud of him because even though they're neighbors, he had to learn the language and he had to learn the, the culture of the Ukrainian people and he began teaching in Ukraine. And Sharon started serving with Send International and she became their bookkeeper and, and served in various other ways. So since 2008, they have been ministering in Ukraine. And I'm anxious to hear a lot more about what they're doing. Last year, um, I got an email saying that they were planning to retire this year. And so this is a bittersweet time. It's been a wonderful, wonderful partnership. We have really enjoyed uh, getting to know them and uh, being able to share in their ministry in Russia and then in Ukraine. And so it's a really hard day to say goodbye because, like I said, we became friends as well as partners in ministry. And so um, I would like you to please give a warm welcome to Dave and Sharon Benzel. There we go. Okay. Um, you know, over 20 years, um, young people think, wow, that's a long time. Us older people think, ah, oh, it just goes by in a blink. Um, but an another interesting way to look at it is um, that's 1% of all of church history. 1% of all of church history, you guys have been helping us go to these places. And, you know, when I think about um, when I, I read about what Jesus said about um, people that helped missionaries, people that helped prophets and apostles and whatnot, Jesus said that if you give even a cup of cold water to a prophet because he's a prophet, um, not because, you know, he's um, a Steelers fan or <laughs> um, because he's from your state or whatever, but because he's on your team. He's on the same team you are. He's doing work that, that you value. He said, you're going to get the prophet's reward. And you've been helping us, not because you really knew us, not because you knew the people we were even helping, but because you saw that we were on the same team and we were serving the same cause. And the reward is the same for all of us because we're all on the same team. It's not just one player that, that gets the trophy, <laughs> except in golf. <laughs> Um, but um, in other sports, it's a, it's a team sport, and the whole team gets to, gets to hold the trophy. And because you have been supporting, 
not just because, <laughs> but part of, uh, partly because you've been supporting missionaries around the world, you're going to get a hold of that trophy too. So don't think that, oh, you know, I, I wish I could have gone or I could never do that. We're all a part of the same team. And we, we feel that maybe a lot more than you do. <laughs> and we really appreciate your faithful support, even in, in difficult times and the economy and whatnot and everything. And you guys were faithful through, through all of that time. And we really appreciate it. We don't have that many churches, so you were a bigger part of of our ministry, and we really, really do appreciate it. And um, there's a couple people like uh, Becky that were really the contact for us, and um, and we really appreciate the the interest, asking questions, and praying for us. I could talk for a long time about Ukraine, and I don't really want to. I want to talk about this, um, but I should uh, say something or other. <laughs> we, uh, as, as Becky said, we were already planning to retire. Um, Ukraine is trying to move more towards Russia, I, 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 sorry, more towards the um, Soviet Union, towards the European Union, towards Europe, um, because they know the standard of, high, of living there is a much higher. Um, and that means moving away from Russia, from the old Soviet ways and whatnot. And um, one of the things they're doing to, to move that way is to start pushing away Russian language. Now, we started in Russia. Um, actually, we started in Kiev learning Russian, and then we went to, to Far East Russia and were there for, for many years. And um, um, even in Ukraine, most people know Russian very well. And so all this time, I've been teaching in Russian. Uh, no problem with it. But now they've passed the law. No more higher education in Russian. Um, no more even like songs on the radio in Russian. <laughs> they, they really, especially now with the war, they really want to move away from Russian. So that was another sign. I mean, just besides the fact that we're getting older and it's, harder, it's hard for us to live there and whatnot. Um, also the fact that, you know, all, all of my classes now, Ukrainians are going to be teaching those classes. So we're not looking for another foreign missionary to come and teach those classes in the seminary. Ukrainians are teaching those. Um, so things are moving forward, and there's, there's plenty of new faculty there. So we praise the Lord for that. I, maybe you didn't realize, but I teach in a seminary, in, in, in a couple different seminaries. I've traveled around uh, to different places, different times. And um, Ukraine has, um, out of the whole... Uh, former Soviet Union, and really out of all of Eastern Europe, even Central Europe, Ukraine has the most evangelical believers of any country. And, um, and so many young people, so many young people that, and, and they're, they're, I'm sure there are nominal ones, but there's so many that are really sincere believers and want to want to live for the Lord. And it's really, it's really great to sit in a class and maybe Maybe one of my classes would be like this whole section, just full of, of young people <laughs> and from all over Ukraine. But, and then go to another school and the same thing there and another school and the same thing there. That's how many young people there are that want, these are the ones that, that want to learn, that are um, taking unpaid leave from their jobs, coming and studying uh, for a week at a time or two weeks at a time and then going back home. Um, they're really committed to learning, um, learning all about God's Word and how to serve more effectively. And um, it's been a real joy to teach them. Sometimes people ask, well, what are you going to do now? And we don't know what the Lord's going to open up for us. We kind of don't want to be thinking about that now. We want to finish well. I noticed in the bulletin it said that we're retired. We're not yet. <laughs> uh, it's the end, of, the end of September is the last day, our last day with, our, with the mission. Um, but some people said, well, maybe you want to teach at a school here. But from what I've heard about schools here, um, and maybe that's what the Lord has for us, I don't know, but um, a lot of, a lot of uh, kids, they don't really want to be there at the Christian school. Their parents made them go for a couple years, and they have to take this Old Testament survey class because, well, it's a requirement, so they've got to be there, but they don't really want to. The students that I've been teaching, they want to. Oh, tell me about uh, oh, we're going to look at the book of Genesis today? Great. I want to learn about the book of Genesis. I want to learn about the book of Ruth. And um, 
they're excited to be there. Um, and unfortunately, it's not always that way in Christian schools here. Um, but it's been a real, and, and um, the, one of our goals as a mission in Ukraine, it's not to evangelize because they've been doing that really well. It's not to start new churches. They've been doing that. Um, for a while, um, the, we have a Bible, a, a church planting major at the seminary, among other majors. In order to graduate, you had to, you had to start a new church. <laughs> you had to plant a new church somewhere. Um, and, that's, and, and every student did. Everyone that graduated did. I, that's, it, they're, they're able to do that. Um, it's a little different than, than here. It's not quite as easy here to, to start new churches like that. But um, one thing they weren't um, familiar with was world missions, uh, international, uh, cross-cultural missions, not even outside of the country, but inside their country. Um, like there's a lot of Chinese students there. There's a lot of students from um, uh, um, Central Asia, even from Africa. And the, the, although the believers are mature in a lot of ways, their, their view of foreigners might be kind of shocking to you. They say, well, if those people want to learn, if those Chinese want to learn about God, they should go back to China and go to a church there. <laughs> if, if those Africans want to learn about God, they should go back to Africa. I'm sure there's a church there somewhere that can tell them about God. That's not our, that's not our responsibility. <laughs> and we're, we're kind of shocked by that. We're glad when we have uh, foreign students and like Susanna <laughs> uh, today here. And, um, but they're, they're changing. They're, they're realizing, no, God has called us to the nation. We have a, we have a story to tell to the nations, not just we have a story to tell to our nation, <laughs> to our people. To our town. We have a story to tell to the nations. And they're starting to learn that, and praise the Lord, they've, they have formed a mission-sending agency, an interdenominational, five different denominations came together, and they formed that, and COVID kind of slowed everything down, and of course the war has totally kind of shut that down. But um, when you think about the, you've heard a lot about, you know, refugees going and um, to, throughout all of Europe and even here in Canada. Some of our students are in Canada right now. Um, um, think about um, about one out of every 40 or 50 of those people that cross, and it's usually women and children, is an evangelical believer. And sometimes when those people come to a country like, say, Czech Republic or uh, some of those other Central European countries, there's more Ukrainian believers there, maybe, <laughs> than Czech believers because of, because of all the refugees that have come. And we pray that, um, hope that they'll, uh, God will work through them in the lives of those countries to which they've gone. Um, anyway, I could uh, keep going on, but I, I need to stop on that. But I do have a, a video I want to show you right now. It's about eight minutes long or so. It was made by Grace College and Seminary just uh, a few months ago. Um, they realized that we had just come from Ukraine and um, that I was a graduate there of the seminary, so they decided to make this video. And um, it kind of uh, maybe captures some of our emotions and stuff at this time. So. Some people in Russia are saying, you know, there shouldn't even be a word Ukraine. There shouldn't be a country called Ukraine because it's just Russia. Russia thinks of Ukraine as rebellious teenagers, and they're not adults. They, they don't have the right to decide. We have to rein them in, and they have no right to exist as a separate country going a different direction. One day, down in the mail room at Grace Seminary in McLean Hall, there was a little notice. It was, it was just this big, nothing flashy. It just said, Send International is um, hoping to start a language learning program, a one-year trial. And they're just trying to get people over and see if the Lord would do something. And so we applied. A few days after we applied, we got a phone call from SEND saying, uh, wouldn't it be great if you and, and the Durham's could go together? And I thought, well, who are the Durham's? We can come to find out their fellow students at Grace. And we were the only two couples that had applied in the whole nation. <laughs> we lived on the same street. So they thought, obviously, we know each other. 
um, and so they became dear co-workers for, for decades. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It was about four months after the wall fell. The day we landed was the first official day of Ukraine being separate from the Soviet Union. They were welcoming people to come and um, accepting students to study. And, you know, there was even a little bit of a euphoria, kind of just all of a sudden people felt more like they're free. And in, in churches they felt that way, but just people in general. When we first came to Ukraine, uh, we thought, well, okay, we're going to study the language, but we're not just going to presume that, okay, we're here and, you know, where do you want us? They, if they invite us, then, we're, then we'll consider that an open door from God. But if no one invites us back, then we traveled to many places. We met lots of people, and um, nobody did invite us back except for the people in Zaporozhye and the head pastor there. Uh, over the whole region, he said, would you come back and work with me? And they wanted to start a Bible school, uh, and they did eventually. That, that school is, is going to this day. Then the mission called and said there's a school opened up in the Russian city of Habarsk, way over on the far east side, northeast tip of, uh, of China. Uh, so that's where we served for many years. Far East Russia is, is humongous. It basically stretches from, if you were to turn it sideways, to uh, New York to California, a strip of like 500 miles wide, very sparsely populated. Yet we had to travel uh, four hours just to get to the next town, and it's just a little town. Far East Russia is where a lot of uh, believers were sent to die. Magadan, a place we went to a few times, that was an area where literally there's just fields of bones, and they're bones of believers. Russia passed a new law that um, said each area can restrict how many foreigners they allow to live in their area, and we weren't allowed to stay there anymore. And so we had already been working in the school for a long time, and so we looked for places where there was uh, uh, other educational opportunities, and so Kiev looked like a much better option. Ukraine was always the Bible belt of, of the whole Soviet Union. Half of all believers were there in Ukraine, and it really has the potential to become a sending country, kind of on the order of, of uh, uh, South Korea or Canada. Uh, they're certainly probably already in the top 10 <laughs> sending country, and they're, they're just getting started. So our goal was always to help build up the churches and to serve them as, as they requested, and, and they wanted us to help with education. That was their request. When a rocket lands, yeah, some people have the direct danger and impact of that, but everyone's hurting. It's a, an attack against the whole country. And we've had hundreds, certainly thousand students, you know, that I've taught in the last uh, 14, 15 years. So how many others have, have suffered in this way? We don't know yet. There's uh, unknown, and, but, and that's our home. Today would have been the last day of my next to last class. <laughs> so I don't know if I'll teach any more classes or not, but it's still our home. We haven't closed up shop there yet. We haven't said goodbye to people. You know, God is good and everything he does is good. And even when he allows war, he's got good purposes. There isn't such a thing as Russia. There isn't such a thing as Ukraine or the US. It's, it's all individuals when it comes down to it. And these individuals are all gonna exist forever. You know, the countries are not, but the individuals are. And, and it's really these individuals are fighting against these individuals, and God is in control of each. You know, he's already decided all the, the, you know, the lengths of their lives and how this is gonna impact this person, how it's gonna impact this person. Fighting can reach to here, but it can't go any further and things like that. And we just have to remind ourselves that God, God is putting limits on all of that. It's not just running wild, and he's using it for good. People's lives are being changed. Yeah, it's, it's costly circumstances, it's, it's painful circumstances, but out of this, people who are fleeing, you know, there, there are people coming to the Lord. I mean, this is the only way for these people to be saved, maybe, is to have these harsh circumstances in their lives. And thankfully, he's got the wisdom to make those calls. Hopefully, Ukraine's gonna uh, emerge from this situation stronger and more prosperous, um, more stable, and maybe widely respected. And maybe God would use that to 
uh, allow uh, the Ukrainian believers to uh, uh, even more effectively spread the gospel. And it's possible that it'd be the other way around, that instead Ukraine's going to be swallowed up in Russia, and then maybe those believers can have an impact <laughs> on this. You know, there's 115 unreached people groups in Russia, and um, Ukrainians have been trying to go into Russia and reach those people, but of course it's very limited opportunity. It's just uh, the process has just just gotten started. We've had students from our school do that, go, go to places in Russia to work. And maybe as a result of this war, maybe Russia will, itself will become more open. We don't know what, what that outcome is going to be, but we can believe that you know, the people that God wants to, wants to work in their lives, He's going to through this. Okay, can we switch gears now and think about um, something that Jesus told us about, uh, that Jesus talked about a long, long time ago. You all know that, um, that Jesus said to some of his first followers, uh, follow me, uh, Matthew um, uh, 4, 19, and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, I'll, I'll do my best to really try to, to make you fishers of men. I mean, some of you, I don't know if I can do it or not, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> no, he said, I'll make you fishers of men. And he didn't say, you have to become fishers of men. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. And that really comforts my heart because when I look at myself, I, don't, I, I can't be a fisher of men. I can't impact the lives of other people. Who, who am I? How can I, how can I do that? But Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. And that's just one of several different metaphors that he says um, about how he, he changes us to become like him and to, through us to reach out uh, to others. And finally, at the end of the book of Matthew, you all remember what he says about go out and make disciples. And, and we kind of jump to that part and say, well, how can I do that? Who am I to do that? but we forget what Jesus says at the beginning <laughs> in Matthew 4. I will make you fishers of men. I'll change you. I'll change your heart. I'll change your character. Um, it's not an issue of what kind of gifts you have and what kind of experience you have. And whatnot. It's a matter of the heart, and I'll change that. And I'll make you someone through whom I can work in the lives of others. And I think as I read uh, Matthew 5, which is just a few verses after Matthew 4, <laughs> 19, I think that um, the very familiar portion of Scripture to us is actually Jesus' explanation of how He changes us. How does that change happen? Because we, we tend to think, okay, we're supposed to change. I have to do it. I have to do something. In our Sunday school class, we heard about uh, faith without works is dead, and we automatically think, okay, what works am I supposed to do so that my faith isn't dead? And that's, that's the whole wrong approach. If I have living faith, it produces works. And um, that's what our teacher really, really emphasized. And when we look at uh, this list, we're going to look real quickly at the Beatitudes. Don't, uh, normally when I teach, it's eight hours. Okay, so today I'm going to really try to shorten it, maybe three or four hours. <laughs> okay. No, I wish. I wish I could talk for you this long, uh, that long about this, because it's, it really is, deserves a lot, of, a lot of attention. And it's not an accident that this is very early in the New Testament. It's not an accident. It's one of the very the most important things that Jesus talked about, but we kind of, it, it kind of has become religious language for us, and we don't, we don't hear it um, anymore in the way that I think Jesus intended. So we're going to look at it uh, a little more closely today. And, and the first thing I want to say to you is that as we look at these uh, eight beatitudes, we call them, comes from the old Latin word that means blessing, blessed, it, it's not a command. Don't look at this and say, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. Okay. 
This is, we know, uh, you, you know the gospel, how, what, what our task is, that we're to believe in what Jesus has done and whatnot. This is also sort of the gospel, but it's what God does in us. While we're believing, when we're believing, what does God do in us? Well, this is one description. There's others in the Bible. But this is one way to look at what God does inside of us when we're real believers. And sometimes maybe you have a question about, boy, am I really a believer? I feel like I'm, I, I see evidence in my life that maybe I'm not, and I see evidence that maybe I am and whatnot. Well, here's another thing to look at. Do you, when you hear these different statements, do they find a place in your heart? You say, yeah, I, I want to be there. Um, that's a sign that God is working in your life. The word blessed, um, we put, those, uh, put the first uh, verse up, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, it's page 1,115 uh, 1, in your pew Bible if you need it, Matthew 5, 3 and following. And um, it starts with the word blessed, and it, that's, that's a religious word today, but understand that when Jesus said it, it wasn't. It was just like the word fortunate or lucky or successful. When, when, when Jesus said blessed, remember there's a big crowd here. This is the Sermon on the Mount, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus goes up on a mountainside, a hillside, and there's a big crowd there, and Jesus preaches to them. And when he says blessed, when he says, let me tell you who are the people that are really happy, that are really successful in life, that really have found life, that really are living. Understand that everybody grabbed their pen and paper, their, their scroll and their scribe, and, <laughs> and, and they're ready to write, oh, Jesus is going to tell us how to be successful. Everybody in the world wants, wants that. Understand that everybody in the world, since the beginning, everyone wants to be blessed. <laughs> now, again, we hear the word blessed, and it, we just put it in a different category, but, but just get that out of your mind. Just think, just think happy, fortunate, lucky. I mean, we hear about, you know, oh, this, uh, this person, oh, he's got, he's got several kids, and they're all healthy, and they all have uh, several kids of their own, and they're all doing well, and he's got a good pension, and his health is good, and we just think, wow, is he, is he fortunate? It's just really well off. He's just, he just has a full life. That's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying, if you want to have a full life, if you want to be the kind of person that everyone else envies, oh, I wish I could be like him, I'll tell you who that is. <clears throat> but when he begins to explain, we kind of have to stop and say, oh, wait a minute, Jesus, I'm not sure I agree. <laughs> Let's look at these real, real quick. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor. In, in Russian and Ukrainian, there's, there's different words for poor. English, we just kind of use this word, but um, there's words that mean poor, but you can work today and eat today. But there's people that are really poor. I don't know what we would say, in poverty or something. And they, they can't work today. They can't eat today. Maybe they're handicapped. Maybe they're drug addicts or something, whatever their circumstances are. But they cannot help themselves. The only thing they can do is beg. That's the word Jesus uses. Maybe today we would say bankrupt. Blessed are the, and we, we expect rich, wealthy, and he says bankrupt. Whoa, <laughs> no, that can't be right, Jesus. I think, I think you got that backwards. Maybe you're having trouble with your, with your Greek here or your Hebrew. But no, he says, blessed uh, are the bankrupt. But of course, he adds in spirit. And we understand this to mean before God, before God, that we have nothing to offer God. We have nothing to show him. Oh, maybe we do these religious things. Maybe we come to church and... Um, um, endure the missionary sermon, 
and um, we, you know, maybe give some money to the church or we uh, help out at a ministry. We do some religious things and we think, wow, I am, you know, I'm way better than my neighbors, that's for sure. And we think we have something good to offer. We sound a lot like that Pharisee in Luke, was it chapter 19, I think, um, where he says, um, God, I thank you I'm not like this other guy. I fast twice a week, I give tithes, I pray every day. I'm really good. I am rich before God. And Jesus said that guy was not rich. <laughs> he said the other guy, the guy that said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's the one that went home justified, accepted by God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those that acknowledge... Un, Actually, every person is poor in spirit. Every person is bankrupt before God. But not everybody acknowledges it. Not everybody accepts it. Not everyone believes it. They think, oh, I'm better. Oh, I live in a Christian nation. Not, not like those heathen over there in those places. Um, and I, I've never killed anyone or I've never done this or that. Well, the fact is we're all bankrupt before God. We have nothing good to offer Him. Even the good things we do um, in Isaiah, Isaiah 64, 6, I think he says that even our acts of righteousness, the good things that we do are just like filthy rags. When you see a kid about to pick up a filthy rag, your little kid, what, what do you say? Ooh, don't touch that. <laughs> you know, get your hands off of that. Oh, I've got to wipe that off. Where's those disinfectant things? That's how God views our attempts to be good before Him. Okay? They're just filthy, filthy rags, not to be touched. Just burn them. <clears throat> but look what He says. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs, the people that acknowledge that they are bankrupt before God. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, uh, heaven is kind of a synonym for God. I mean, normally in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, they say kingdom of God. But Matthew, as a, as a Jew writing to Jews, they didn't, they didn't like to say God all the time, and so they often said heaven. And so that's what, that's what he, he says here. It just means the kingdom of, kingdom of God. There's no, there's no difference between kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. It's God's plan for the earth, <laughs> for humanity. It's, it's all that is, that is included in salvation and everything. There's is. And it's interesting, he, he says is. When we'll see uh, real quickly in the next ones that he's, he's talking about the future, but this one he already says is. Next one. Blessed are those who mourn. And we might think, well, what are they mourning about? Because everyone cries. Everyone uh, feels pain. But in the context, and as we'll see the, the progression here, it's those that realize they're bankrupt before God, and it, it breaks their heart. It, they mourn over the sin that they do. Yeah, we all mourn over, over hurt that people uh, cause in our lives. We've all cried over the pain of the sin of others. But even more maybe bitter are the ter tears and the, uh, the weeping of um, when we realize our sin causes pain to others. And to God most of all. To God most of all. We can talk a lot about this. But it's very interesting. He says they will be comforted. And it's not just, you know, that God wipes away our tears and says, hey, it'll be okay. He makes it okay. It's not that we'll just kind of forget about the pain. He's going to make it all right somehow. That's an amazing thing. That's an amazing thing. We're not going to have any reason to feel pain, to be uh, mourning in the future. But right now we do mourn. We're aware of our sinful. So you look in the mirror of our lives and see, uh, again, I caused pain in this situation, in that situation. Again, I didn't. I measure up. Again, I came short. I am bankrupt. Even now as a believer, even now as a believer for many years, 
that's still who I am apart from God's uh, mercy in my life. Continuing on, blessed are the meek. Meek is a word that we don't use very often today. Um, and kind of, when we do use it, it's kind of a negative thing. But, you know, some of the great heroes of the Bible, I mean, just pick Moses, the meekest man on earth, uh, Numbers uh, twelve three, I think. And uh, Jesus is also called meek. Meek is not a negative thing. Meek is a positive thing. Not being meek is sinful, <laughs> we can say. But well, So what is meek? Anyway, um, uh, again, it's a, it's a big discussion, but I would just say very briefly that meekness is not asserting your rights, not, not feeling like you have the right to go to the head of the line, that, well, I've been waiting here. I'm the next one. No, meekness says, you go ahead. I am not worthy. Meekness comes not because you're trying to act a certain way, but because you see who you really are. You know who you really are. Maybe other people don't, don't see that. Well, I've got a tie on, so nobody knows I'm a sinner. <laughs> no one knows that I'm spiritually bankrupt. You know, you don't, when I walked up here, I, I, I hope you didn't think, wow, he looks like a real sinner. But, but we, we know ourselves that we are bankrupt before God. And that, that causes us to act differently. It causes us to let other people go ahead of us. Um, we think that the ones who will inherit the earth, the ones that are going to get the good jobs, the ones that are going to get the nice houses, the ones that are going to um, get all the good things in life, they're the ones that are going to grab. They're the ones that are going to be the most assertive and be the fastest and put themselves forward. Oh, if you want that job, you've got to be really confident in everything. That's the way the world works. That's the way the world thinks. But that's not the way it really is. Who's going to inherit the earth? Who's going to get it all? The people that say, that realize who they are inside, that they're spiritually bankrupt and say, oh, you go ahead. I, I, don't, deserve, <laughs> I don't deserve this. That's who is going to get it all. They will inherit the earth. They're going get to get it all. By the way, Jesus is quoting the Old Testament here, and all of these principles, uh, all of these different uh, steps or stages that we see here, they all come from the Old Testament. Jesus isn't making up something new. He's giving a, a good, concise summary of Old Testament teaching. But well, we, can't, we can't stop to look at that. Uh, next one, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for... What do you hunger and thirst for? When, when somebody takes something away from you, interferes with you, what, I don't know what it is. Maybe you're, you're on your way to work in the, on the highway and somebody cuts you off, you know. And what makes you mad is what I'm trying to say. What makes you mad? That is what you're hungering and thirsting for. Um, that is what, uh, what, what you're really putting your effort into. That's what you're hungering and thirsting for. And he says, blessed, the really lucky people, the really happy people, are the ones who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We say, righteousness? Who wants that? <laughs> Again, uh, in, the, in our Sunday school, we were talking about, we were listening about um, uh, the commands of God, and which we think of when we think of righteousness. And he said that, the uh, teacher said that, you know, the commands of God are just saying, don't don't go here and there. Jump in the pool. This pool is a great pool. It's really fun in the water. It's awesome in the water. Come on, jump in. And we're scared to, like little kids. We don't want to jump in because we, th I don't know. I'm going to get all wet. I don't know if I'll swim and all that. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And when we just think, I, I remember, I, I grew up in the church and thinking as a little kid, thinking, who wants righteousness? I know I got to. <laughs> because I, I want to be with God forever, so i got to be righteous. But, well, when we start to realize that righteousness is just loving everyone, loving God, loving others, acting correctly, we don't hunger and thirst to, to act incorrectly. <laughs> I mean, we might at first. We're deceived. We think, oh, sin, that really satisfies. 
but the older we get, we realize it does not satisfy. Again, we could talk a lot about this. They will be filled. What a great promise for those who are bankrupt before God. We will get that righteousness. We will be complete in Him. We will be, become people who act rightly, who know how to love, who, who don't no longer hurt others. How many parents are here that have hurt their kids lately? How many kids are here that have hurt their parents, spouses, hurting each other? We all do that. And we don't want to. We want to be right. We want to be loving. And it's going to happen. We, they will be filled. We will, you're never going to long for it in eternity because you'll have it. You'll have it already. You need to keep moving. Um, verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Again, talk a lot about this. It kind of sounds like if we're merciful, then we'll be saved. <laughs> but I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. We know from other places of Scripture that that's, it's actually the opposite. When we believe we're going to get mercy, we begin to act with mercy. And you know, when I was thinking about this, uh, these things and thinking, uh, why does he say mercy? Why doesn't he say love? Because mercy kind of seems, it seemed to me, to be kind of a little simpler, lower, and love, that's the really high thing. But and one day I, I suddenly realized that, no, you know what? Mercy is showing love even when it's hard, or especially when it's hard, and when it's painful to you. It's loving people who are hurting you. Do you realize that in eternity, we'll never have to show mercy. We'll never have to forgive. We'll never be hurt by the people we're trying to love. But right now, in this time, for God's strategic reasons, He's left us here as believers, <laughs> and we are to show mercy to those that don't deserve it. And it's painful. It hurts. It's not easy. We don't, we don't want to do it. But what helps us do it? We remember, I'm bankrupt myself. I'm no different than them. I deserve nothing uh, but judgment, but God gave me mercy. I can show mercy to others. Continuing on. Uh, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We think of this pure in heart, and kind of in English, we think of pure in heart as somebody that's really just kind of a, a clean person, a nice person, a person that doesn't have bad thoughts, cruel nature, or anything. They're, they're just a sweet person. It's kind of, oh, she's so, she's so pure in heart. Well, that's not exactly how the Hebrews thought of this phrase. For them, pure in heart means... He's only got one thing on his mind. He's only got one goal. A guy, that, a guy that's trying to decide between two girls, he's not pure in heart. <laughs> when he's with Janice, he's thinking about Betsy. And when he's with Betsy, he's thinking about Janice. And he's not, I hope there's no Janices or Betsys here. But <laughs> there, um, that's not pure in heart. The one that just stays focused, you get into your car and you think, okay, I'm going here and I'm going here. No, you can't do that. You can say, I'm going here and then I'll go here. But you can't go two places at the same time. And that's, that's being pure in heart. That's having one goal. What is the one thing you want more than anything? And look what the, the reward is, the result here. They will see God. As we, as we acknowledge that we're bankrupt and we mourn over that bankruptcy, we, we cry over it, and we begin to see ourselves differently and let other people go first, and we hunger and thirst for righteousness, and God begins to, to change us, and we begin to uh, show mercy, to others, we start to have higher goals. Before, our goal was, I don't know, be rich or have a 
beautiful family um, and all these different things that the world seeks. But we start to have a new goal. We want to know God. Um, as, as immature believers, we, we took joy in what God gives, the gifts of God, but we begin to start taking joy in God himself. Um, you grandparents know that a lot of your grandkids, they really, especially the, uh, younger, you're, they don't really care about you, but they love the gifts you give them. <laughs> and you feel like that's the only way I have to have a relationship with them is to keep giving them gifts. And that's, it's questionable whether that's wise or not, but that's, that's just the way it is. But you long for the day when they would say, Grandma, I don't care about your gifts. Yeah, I like when you serve me ice cream and cookies, and I like this and that that you give me for Christmas, but I just want to spend time with you. Wouldn't that be the greatest thing you could ever hear? And that's, that's what Jesus is talking about here, that we want God more than we want God's good gifts. And he's going to give us his good gifts. He's going to keep giving them. But we will see God. With, and, and, you know, not just that we see God, but we will be in relationship with God. We'll see him, and he won't be angry. He won't look at us with judging eyes. He'll accept us, just like your grandmother uh, accepts that little grandchild that seeks her, seeks her out. <clears throat> Got to keep moving on. Uh, the next one, blessed are the peacemakers. This is one that the whole world knows. They put it in the, the logo of the United Nations and stuff like that. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called uh, children of God, sons of God. And, you know, a peacemaker, peacemaker is not just a, um, a person that calms the quarrel. I mean, yeah, we want that. We want somebody to stop the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, and maybe a peacemaker can do that. I, it kind of seems like, no, it can't. But, um, but that's, that's a good thing, stopping quarrels, stopping brothers from fighting and stuff like that. But you, you know the Hebrew word for peace is, is a lot more than peace, right? Shalom. It's, it's a lot more than just the absence of conflict. And a peacemaker is not just somebody that stops the fighting. A peacemaker is somebody that brings, that creates, that produces shalom in the lives of others. These are people that were, wherever they go, whatever they're involved in, they, they make things better. Life is better for everyone. They're, they're producing, they're creating shalom. All the good things that, that, that are included in that word. And that's what God's like. God wants to reconcile, and He wants to bless. He wants to cause things to be better, to get right. And when we accept that as our goal, we kind of take on the family business. It's not just God anymore, but it's God and sons. <laughs> and, and now we're in the business with Him, and we're trying to reconcile people to God and trying to produce a better life. Uh, meet the needs of others and whatnot. And you see what it says? They will be called sons of God. They're going to be reckless. You know, he really acts a lot like his father. <laughs> We've all seen uh, kids that, um, that look or act just like their parents, just like their dad, just like their mom. Uh, well, boy, is, is she his or mother's daughter, huh? And when we are seeking what God seeks, when we're trying to bring shalom, peace, into the lives of other people, we're being like God. And you see, we're starting to get, we're starting to become fishers of men at this point. We're starting to, to step out of our comfort zone and give and work in the lives of other people and try to produce the good for them. But don't forget, it, it's, not, it's not that we're doing it because we're commanded. It's because we've seen our poverty of, of uh, spirit before God. We've seen that we're bankrupt before Him, and we mourn over that. And um, we see ourselves in a new light, and we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we begin to show mercy to other people because they're in the same situation we are. 
and we're no better than them. And we start to have this goal of, of uh, this personal um, you know, w- desire to see God, to know God. And we begin to affect other people's lives. But, you know, when we do that, when we begin to talk to other people about God, about reconciling with God, and we have to talk about sin. We have to talk about repentance. And not everyone wants to do that. Not everyone wants to hear that. Um, less and less in our day. I mean, there was a time that they would print the sermons from Sunday church in the newspaper. <laughs> I mean, how long ago was that now? Um, Billy Graham would come to a place and they would print the whole text of his sermons in the newspaper. Can you imagine? They would never do that now. Uh, people don't want to hear talk about sin, about repentance, and, and that kind of thing. And so this last one, uh, next verse, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We as we begin to try to impact people's lives and talk to them about things they don't want to talk about, some of them are going to react very negatively and there's going to be persecution. It may just be that they just shut you out of their company um, and they don't associate with you. It may be that they uh, don't um, give you a promotion that you deserve. Maybe it's neighbors that just say, no, we don't want to, we don't want to visit with you anymore. We don't want our kids to play with your kids. And, and it goes on and on. And it may be even official government persecution. Persecution happens in lots of ways, psychologically, socially, as well as physically even sometimes. Um, But you see that uh, it ends with the very place where he began. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, and we may feel like, wow, the whole world's against us. What's this world coming to? And um, we know that the dark forces behind these actions that we see around us, and, and we start to feel like, wow, we're just... And he says, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Don't forget. Don't forget, even when you're being persecuted, you do have it all. (laughs) And um, uh, this is just temporary. And he goes on to talk about this, um, that um, you should just rejoice and be exceedingly glad when this happens. And you have, at that point, become fishers of men. You have begun to to impact the lives of others. Not everyone's going to accept, but you're going to be spreading the gospel, uh, spreading the kingdom um, in a way that we never could have imagined earlier. Well, I'm sorry that that's so brief uh, a survey of those verses, but I hope you see that it's, it's a process for every believer. It's not a pro. Well, he's She's pure and hard, and he hungers and thirsts for righteousness, and, well, I, I cry. <laughs> um, I mourn. No, this is, a, this is a process for each one of us, and it's not like we do it one time and we're done. No, this is, this is a room we live in. Every day we need to remind ourselves, I am bankrupt before God, but in Christ I am complete in Him, um, Colossians um, 2, 10, I think. And um, all of these things, again, they're not commands. They're results. They're what God is doing in us to make us to be like His Son. So I want to thank you once again for having us these many years and letting us visit and share and for the different ways that you have uh, supported us, put us up and... um, housing and whatnot and here and um, I just pray that um, God will continue to bless you for that and use you in the lives of of, uh, other missionaries and other ministries um, and that he'll meet your needs here uh, because you've been sacrificing to meet the needs the needs of others elsewhere let's let's pray father I thank you for this church they've had um, ups and downs they've had Um, uh, vacancies and um, times of great blessing and I just pray that you would continue to work in them uh, in their midst here and that they would be a light uh, in this town in this area that you would give them wisdom that you would provide um, the leaders that um, you uh, think best for them I pray that you would um, help each one to see 
that apart from what Jesus has done for us, um, they, uh, we are all uh, bankrupt before you. And that uh, this process whereby you make us into uh, more and more into fishers of men would be uh, actively happening in each of their lives and they would see it and rejoice um, at, at the activity of your spirit in their hearts. Uh, even though at times it, it's painful, even though it's not e easy to think about ourselves being bankrupt, I just pray that you would uh, continue to bring them through this process and um, that their light would shine uh, before men and you would be glorified through them. Um, we want Jesus to come back soon. We want to be delivered from um, this world, but uh, while you think it best to leave us here, help us to be um, those who spread your kingdom here and throughout the world. Thank you for um, uh, this church, for this time that we've had together, uh, quickly looking at your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.